Open your Bibles to the fourth chapter, the book of Ephesians. We're continuing growing up in the hymn and all things. Glory to God. We did last Sunday morning, last Sunday night. We didn't finish, so we're going we're to finish this morning. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Our text comes from the first through the 16th verses, and uh, so you just be aware of that. If you want to read the whole passage, that's fine. That will, it will do you good. If you weren't with us last week, we encourage you to go to the Internet and um, listen to our uh, podcast, or our, our, uh, we also have our video cast. Um, we we um, video cast and, pod and, and audio cast our um, services, and uh, we're believing God for the day. We could go streaming live, but we need to be in a situation where we can get like, you know, uh, uh, 30, 30 meg uh, symmetrical, I guess they call it. Uh, 30 meg up, 30 meg down. Hallelujah. And when they, one of these days, time one will come into the 21st century. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Uh, but we, we're talking about the steps to spiritual growth. Now, you need to understand if you don't have what we went before, you'll miss out a little bit. But last Sunday night, we started getting into how spiritual growth comes. <clears throat> Number one, it comes from the Word of God. You must feed on the Word of God. Number two, we, uh, we must mature as a body. We talked about last Sunday night how important it is to grow up. Everybody say, grow up. God don't like ugly. Say, God don't like ugly. He ain't talking about your looks either. He's talking about attitudes. Amen. You can't come to church and hate people. Actually, the Bible says if you hate your brother, you, you know, the love of God doesn't abide in you. You know, how can you say, I love God and hate my brother? Well, look over there. You don't believe. Look over in 1 John. Hallelujah. You know, the love of God's important. But I, I know people sitting in churches hating folk, right? You know, they say, well, I don't hate them. You know, I love them. But I never will forget what that old devil did to me. Y'all have heard that story Brother Hagin's told before, haven't you? Amen. Amen. Um, chapter 2, verse 8 says, Again, I write into uh, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because darkness is past, and the true light now shineth. He that saith he is in the light, and hateth his brother, is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness has blinded his eyes. Well, God's Word has a lot to say about being not, not liking people around you, doesn't it? Amen? I said, amen? You, can't, you cannot say, I love God, whom you cannot see, and hate your brother who you can see. So God wants us to walk in love. I'm going to tell you, church, there's a commandment. Jesus said, this is my commandment, that you love one another. There's no escaping that commandment, church. There's no redefining that commandment, church. You can't make up your own definitions of what love is. Amen. Greater love than there hath no man than this, they layeth down his life for his brother. What if they've done me wrong? Well, you know, you still love them. Stop singing another somebody done me wrong song. Sounds like a song about that one time. It's just another somebody done me somebody done me wrong song. Remember that song by Neil Diamond or somebody? Somebody like that. Hallelujah. Love forgives. Go to First Corinthians chapter thirteen, if you will. Reading from the King James in verse 4, it says, and go ahead and look, look for the amplified version of this. We'll read that, out, you know, get that ready to put up. It says, charity, now the word charity is translated from the Greek agape, which is, uh, according to W.E. Vines, expository Greek New Testament words, transfer, translated as the love of God, the, the God kind of love, love in the manner that God possesses it himself, the love that God is. So this word charity, now understand at the time the King James translated, is translated, charity was a demonstration of selfless love. You gave to people who didn't have anything. And understanding the monarchical mindset of the Brits at that time, amen, you know, the, pe the, the, the poor people were peons. The rich people, the ruling class, the, the royalty, uh, that class of people, they ran in a caste system, and you weren't allowed to, to, to move between the, the different levels of society. And so for, to give to someone who had without was a pure demonstration of, of self-sacrifice and self-abasement to stoop yourself. And so when they looked for the word that would best convey the God kind of love, they chose at that time the word charity. Now today it just means giving to the United Way. It just don't carry the same meaning anymore. You know, it actually means a tax deduction, charitable contributions. 
it's another tax deduction. I'll give, you know, or I'll give, make sure my name's on the new wing of the hospital. But see, that's not what the word means. The word means love in the manner that God has or the manner that God is. So let's just say this. We're just going to change the word of God, uh, uh, charity back to love, uh, or the God kind of love. And that's what we're saying. Love suffers long and is kind. Love envies not. Love vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Hallelujah. Let's read that aside the Amplified Bible. And it says, Love endures long and is patient and kind. Love never is envious, nor boils over with jealousy. It's not boastful or vainglorious. It does not display itself haughtily. It is uh, not conceited, arrogant, or inflated with pride. It is not rude, that is, unmannerly, and does not act unbecomingly. Love, that is, God's love in us, does not insist on its own rights or its own way. Wow. Boy, I'll tell you right there, buddy, we could preach a 45-week sermon right there. Oh, man. I could stop and do a series on not seeking its own way or its own rights. Yes. Ouch. Hallelujah. Are y'all here? You gone home. I mean, you know, the theme song of this past generation was Frank Sinatra's I Did It My Way. Huh? Are y'all here? It's all about me. I mean, we know, we got that song we sing, it's all about you. But the theme song for most people is, it's all about me. Hello? I mean, you step on my toes and buddy, buddy, I'm going to tell you what I, you are marked out. You are, you are nailed to the wall. I'll never forgive you. And if I do forgive you, it's going to be on certain conditions. Yeah. The only way I'm going to forgive you is this is the condition on which, upon which you could be forgiven. Who do you think you are? God set the rules for forgiveness. I said God set the rules for forgiveness. What are the rules for forgiveness? Forgive. <laughs> Pretty simple. Right. Not real complicated. And when you go, go turn over to, now listen, y'all just leave that up there. But y'all turn over to Mark 11, 20, uh, uh, Mark 11. <clears throat> go down to verse 25. <clears throat> Why? Why are you going to 25? Because y'all know 22, 23, and 24 by heart. I can quote it with me. But Mark eleven twenty five. 25, now remember that? He says, and when you stand praying, believe that you receive, you know, uh, and you shall have, da, 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 you know, uh, therefore I say unto you, what things ever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. That ends verse 24. Yeah, right. Oh, we quote that. I have what I say, glory to God. I'm a faith man, glory to God. I got it, hallelujah. I believe, I receive it. I confess it. It's mine now. Go ahead. Yeah. I mean, we start preaching like that. People, ha, 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 glory to God. Verse 25 starts out, and. Is that what it says? And. Now, how many remembered your logic, uh, your logic equations or questions, um, either in, in a logic class or in your mathematical equations and stuff? There was, there was logic involved. And you always had to take the logic stuff. Y'all remember that? And or. Remember that? And or. Yeah. And so you can have an equation that says 2 plus 2 equals 4 or 3 plus 3 equals 7. Is that true or false? False. It's true. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Nathan's going to school for music. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because the word or is there. Or means only one side of the equation has to be true to make it a true statement. However, you take that exact same statement and say 2 plus 2 equals 4 and 3 plus 3 equals 7. Is that true or false? False. He did take your mom and did it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Why? Because the word and means both sides have to be true in order for it to be a true statement. One side being false makes the whole thing false. But if you put or in there, then they only have to have one side true to make it true. Okay? So here we go. What things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. And Jesus did not say, or when you stand praying, forgive. Did he? Did he say that? He said, and. 
What's that mean? In order for both sides of the equation to be true in your life, you've got to function in both of them. See, we don't preach that enough. Uh -huh. Oh, brother, no, 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 don't, don't even tell me, Brother Hagen. I, I heard, I got tape series that Brother Hagen preaches on Mark 11, 25, how that it makes 20, really 24 is conditional on 25. The word and makes verse 24 a conditional promise. Amen? And the condition is this. And when you stand praying, forgive. If ye have aught against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven which is in heaven forgive you your trespasses. Now that's a pretty bold and strong statement. Well, that's, that's not for the New Testament believer. Then Mark eleven twenty four is not for the New Testament believer. Exactly. Hello? Well, I don't, you know, we're already forgiven. It doesn't matter. Then 24 doesn't apply to us either. Because he said it in the same sentence, in the same message, in the same breath, probably. Mm -hmm. And put and in there. If he had put or in there and made it, made it either one, you know, well, you can just forgive or you can live by faith. It doesn't matter which one you do. One of them will work for you. He made it conditional. He made your faith walk conditional on your forgiveness or love walk. Hello. Y'all here, you're going home. He made your faith walk. Now, well, I don't believe that. That's in the Gospels. That's not for us. Oh, my, 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 my. Turn over to Galatians chapter 5. Anybody here going home? Yeah, we're here. Doggone it. I closed that. I was right there at it. Verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised, don't mean a thing. Trying to you know, become righteous because you, you say, well, I'm circumcised under the law, or, oh, I'm under faith, I'm not circumcised. He said, listen, you hear it? Let's use this on the grace people. I, whether you're under grace or under the law, it doesn't mean anything. What does mean something? Faith which works by love. You can argue I'm a grace person or I'm a law person and it don't mean anything. Are you walking by faith through love? That's what he just said right here. So, so Paul makes Jesus' statement from Mark 11, 24 and 25, New Testament doctrine. Put that in your little, I don't believe it, pipe smoke it. You got a lot of people that I don't believe that. I've got some excuse why they don't have to do something. You've got to walk in love. Let me say this. If you're not walking in love, you're not walking with God. If you're not walking in forgiveness. Look, see, people get all distressed and they've been out of shape and they got all kinds of problems because they're not walking in love and forgiveness. Well, you don't know what so-and-so did to me. It don't matter what they did to you. Unforg your unforgiveness doesn't hurt them. It hurts you. Amen? It hurts your faith walk. Now, I want everybody to be like those bobblehead dogs. Have you seen them in the back? See? Yeah. It's kind of really hit a bump. Well, you just hit a bump in church. So this bobblehead it for me. Come on, guys. We ought to get past red bobbleheads. I thought that would be cool. Amen. Everybody ride right around. Pastor Ed said, and just bobblehead all around. All right. In the back window of your car. So, Jesus said, we love Mark eleven twenty two. Oh, what things shall you do? Know, verily, verily, I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that the things he saith shall come to pass, he'll have whatsoever he saith. Uh, therefore, I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. And we stop there and run around the room and dance. I mean, we grab the end of the row, and we go, oh, glory to God, we hallelujah. But Jesus said, and when ye stand praying, forgive. If you have all against him. Well, I don't have all against him. They did something to me. I don't have anything. Whoa, 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 whoa. If you are holding the fact that they haven't come on your conditions to ask for your forgiveness, and you, you'll forgive them if they'll come on your conditions, you're in unforgiveness. 
Because what if they never come and ask? Uh -oh. Then you're walking in unforgiveness, waiting on them to ask, and 99% of the time, like we said last week, on your, on your conditions. You got to meet, I, I remember like we said last week, there was a preacher a few years ago that this, another preacher had said something, and he set the conditions upon which that minister had to repent in order to be, to be recognized as forgiven. And I said, who gives you the right to set those conditions? You don't. The parameters are forgive. If you go all against somebody, forgive them. Well, how can I have all? If you are upset or angry or mad or uh, whatever or resentful of someone because they did something to you, and, uh, and although they haven't, you know, uh, as soon as they repent, I'll forgive them. Jesus didn't say if they repent, forgive them. He said forgive. I said, Jesus said forgive. Hello? How many are here? Raise your hand. If you're here, raise your hand. How many are not here? Raise your hand. Adam raised his hand. Adam, you're here. Okay? All right. Everybody, everybody tell Adam, just point and say, you're here, Adam. Okay. How many don't know if you're here or not? The clowns over there. <sighs> The, the, there's a certain question you probably shouldn't ask for those, uh, that bunch in here. They're coming or going. Hallelujah. <laughs> Actually, I think they're in the middle. They're, they're not coming or going. They're sitting still right now. Hallelujah. Amen. Forgiveness, therefore, becomes essential to spiritual growth. You will become stagnant in spiritual growth, walking in unforgiveness. Amen, Brother Benny? Amen. Oh, you might, think you're, you might think you're doing fine. You might think things are wonderful. You might think this. Well, of course you are. If the devil gets you in a certain place where things are just, he's just kind of got you under his, he'll take the pressure off of you. Yeah. He'll let you think everything's wonderful and hunk dory. Amen. And the whole time you're just sitting in water, it's becoming more and more stagnant every day. You want to be in moving waters. <laughs> Amen? You know, all these people have been getting that flesh-eating bacteria. It's in, it's in these ponds that are stagnant ponds, and it's, they're hot. And they're falling in them, and they get, you know, when they get cut or something, that, that bacteria gets in. You know, it's, it's a nasty thing. But you, well, I want, I, so I, no, no, no. I'll, I'll go to a moving river. I, I don't want to get no stag. Listen, have you ever seen that movie, uh, U.S. Marshals with uh, Wesley Snipes and, you know, the big dog? Yeah. Tommy Lee. Tommy Lee. Yeah, the big dog, the lead dog. Uh -huh. And Snipes gets in that water and it's covered in green stuff and he comes up. Right. I'm thinking, man, you want to get away bad. I just turn myself in. I ain't, I ain't getting in with the gators and the algae. You know, I'll go to jail. You know? <laughs> just be honest with you. Hallelujah. You know, we, it's spiritual Christians, you know, when you get an unforgiveness, you're out of love and you're in stagnant waters. It might be wet. But you don't want to drink it, you don't want to cook with it, right. and you don't want to swim in it. Now, we want to be in the rivers that flow out of heaven, glory to God. Yeah. Hallelujah. He that's filled with the Spirit, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. You don't want to be stagnant water, you want to be living water, amen? Hallelujah. So in order to grow spiritually, you're going to have to forgive. So he says, and when you stand praying, forgive. If you have ought against any, that your Father which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Amen? So it's imperative to grow spiritually, to grow up in Christ, is one of the parameters of your life has to be forgiveness. Let me tell you how, how fast you need to forgive. Let me, let me say this from personal experience. Carrying something on and not forgiving right away simply sets you back every day you don't forgive. It, it puts you back every day you don't forgive. You're losing ground every day you don't forgive. To the point you can deceive yourself into believing everything's okay. I'm wonderful. It's all great. If they'll just take care of their side of it, I'll be all right. They'll be all right because I'm, I'm, I'm this and I'm that. No, you're in unforgiveness. You're not growing. You might think you are. You might think you got it together. You might think God's talking to you. The devil, the Bible says Satan can appear as an angel of light. The devil can call you my son or my daughter. You're right. Amen. He can get a spiritual voice. Brother Hagen, how many of you ever read his book, uh, I Went to Hell? 
How many ever heard the sermon series or the teaching on I went to hell? And talk, remember, now remember how after he was raised up off the bed of affliction. Remember that? Y'all yeah. remember that? You know that uh, he had he, been on that bed, he'd been very bed fast. He had died two or three times during that time. And then he got saved and he's on that, but he kept, and God kept beginning, he started reading the Bible and God began to start talking to him. And finally he, he, he saw it, that he had to, he had to act on his faith. And he got up off the bed, stood up, went in there and ate breakfast, walked to the table. Grandpa said, has Lazarus been raised up? He said, yeah, Grandpa, the Lord raised him up. <coughs> he said, well, fix your plate, sit down. And they don't talk at Grandpa's table. So they sat there in quietness and ate. He went back to his room. He's laying in the bed that same day. Been, listen, been raised up from a deathbed. Walked, got up and walked for the first time in 18 months. All the paralysis left his body. And then he's laying there in bed. And he heard a voice say, What is life? It is but a vapor that appeareth for a season, then vanisheth away. He said, you, The Lord raised you up as a testimony. And then, he said, then the voice said, Set your house in order for today. You'll surely die. He thought it was God. Because they were scriptures from the Bible. Yeah, yeah. He thought it was the Lord speaking to him. He raised him up for a testimony that God can heal, but today he was going to die. He laid from 1 o'clock to sometime that later on that afternoon, waiting to die. I said, waiting to die. And that voice, you know, he, 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 he started talking to God, and all of a sudden he heard another voice say, With long life will I satisfy thee and show thee my salvation. He said, Who that? Who said that? And the voice said, Song 91. <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> and he realized it was a devil misquoting scripture to him. Yeah. What am I saying? You can think you're okay because the voice is talking to you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The voice will even quote scripture. Satan quoted scripture to Jesus. You go to, Mark, you go to Luke chapter 4 and read that. <coughs> Satan tempted Jesus three times. Yeah, yeah. And after Jesus had nailed him twice with the word, the third time Satan said, when he took him to the pinnacle of the temple and said, cast thyself down from hence, for it, and then Satan said this, for it is written, yeah, yeah. his angels shall bear thee up, thus thou dash thy foot against the stone. And Satan tried to use the word to get Jesus to commit suicide. And Jesus said, it is also written, yeah. thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? Y'all here, you go home. Y'all here? Yeah. Jesus said to forgive. You cannot come up and say, well, the Lord showed me that this way, you know, if they'll do this, then I can forgive. Now, he didn't say, hey, there's no conditions on your responsibility as a believer to forgive. Yeah. There are no parameters other than forgive. There's no conditions you could put on anybody else other than you forgive. Now, I know that's tough for some people to swallow. I know people have done you wrong. They've done me wrong. I've had people say stuff about me that make your hair curl. Hello? Or straighten it out if you got curly hair. Oh, my. You wouldn't believe it. If we told you some of the stuff people told, said to us or went out and said about us or wrote about us, you would, you, you'd have a hard time believing it. Yeah. We got to forgive them. You got to walk in love toward them. You can't hate them. Amen. You got to love them. And sometimes you love them by faith. Yeah, it's hard. But you gotta, you gotta, you've got to make a decision. I'm going to walk in love toward them. That's always joyous. Yeah. <laughs> Especially when you just heard 30 seconds before what they said about you. Oh, yeah. Hello. Right. I remember running into somebody one time, and, you know, uh, in, a, in a situation after they had called me the fruitless preacher of a two-faced gospel. Just we smile, hug them, say we love you. How you doing? Praise the Lord. Oh, you, you, I mean, there's, oh yeah, you got emotion. Your flesh can want it. So you got to keep your flesh. I probably said, I keep my body. I'm not going to say you ain't going to have emotion. But you got to walk in love. Mm -hmm. well, how do I you know if I'm not walking in love or not? If you can't be in the same room with them, you ain't walking in love. It's hmm. a good rule. 
Amen. Kind of like Mr. Uh, uh, Wickham from Pride and Prejudice. How many Pride and Prejudice fans do we have here? Jessica? Nick? Go ahead and raise your hand. All right. The Hammond's Girls? Anybody else? That, how many like Jane Austen? How many have never read Jane Austen? You've seen the movie, son. Don't, you, you know, you watched them. He does not. He, he likes them. <laughs> He's got to keep his image up with, the, with, the, with his posse. All right. You know, well, I have to leave Mr. Wickham example out. It won't work for most of you. But there was, there was, a, there was one scene in the movie where he, he, he's, kind of a, he's kind of one of those people who present himself one way, but he's really something else. And Mr. Darcy was going to be somewhere, and he said he couldn't be there because things, you know, scenes may rise that are unpleasant for all. But if that's how you feel, you're not walking in love and forgiveness. Now, y'all need to stop looking at me like a dog who got a new bone. I took, we took Maddie to the kennel this morning, and uh, I reached up there. They got free, free dog bones, you know. I reached out there and pick up one, hand, put it down there. She sits it and turns and walks away because <laughs> it's not her type. Her type. <laughs> you snooty, arrogant mutt. I threw it back. I mean, she really did. I asked Nathan. He's standing there. She's... And walked off. <laughs> You're a dog. It's a dog bone. Eat the thing. It's not my brand. She protested one time for a week. We had bought some. We had run out of our regular dog. We bought some while we were at a grocery store somewhere. We had to have it real quick. We just grabbed some some other brand. And she would go two days without eating. <laughs> And finally get so hungry, she'd eat it, but in protest. Sure. She said, protest the whole time. Finally, I said, forget this. Went and bought her regular dog food, brought it in, put it down. And boy, she went and ate it up in 30 seconds. <laughs> gone. Kind of like Teddy Huffman in the gyms. Gone over death triumphant. Gone. Anyway. Oh, yeah. She's got us trained. <laughs> she's setting the conditions of the food she'll eat. Yeah. <laughs> But see, when we confessed Jesus Christ as Lord, we came into submission to his authority. Well, y'all hear you're going home. The Word of God is not a book of suggestions. That went over big. And I know grace these ex hyper extended, hyper extended, hyper grace people, these excessive grace people always want to say, you know, uh, I'm under grace, it doesn't matter. Listen, you know, you can, you, you can, uh, Ephesians 1 through 3 is where we are. Ephesians 4, 5, and 6 is how we live. You can't get around me 4, 5, and 6. There are a lot of people who only want to believe four, chapters 1 through 3. You can't do that. You got to go the rest of the way. You got to take the rest of it. <clears throat> Paul starts out chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Stand fast, therefore, in the vocation where you're called. Amen. He goes to talking about being found worthy of the calling you're called with. The command of forgiveness is that. It's a command. It is a New Testament. If you want, for lack of a better word, I love to upset people who are stupid. And people who, who, who get crazy on stuff. For lack of a better word, walking in forgiveness is a New Testament commandment. It's a law. Jesus said, forgive. Well, that was Jesus. That was before, before, the, before the New Testament. Okay, Paul said, faith works by love. If you don't walk in love, your faith won't work. Hello? Galatians 5, 6, faith works by love. Well, what does that mean? You're displeasing to God. No, I'm under grace. Pa Paul also wrote in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, without faith it is impossible to please him. For they that come to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. But if your faith didn't, if you won't walk in love, your faith won't work, therefore you can't please God, you're a God displeaser. You've got to walk in love. Part of walking in love is forgiving folk. Yeah. Yeah, the Lord showed me one time, because this was, I was dealing with something in my own life, and I, and I dealt with a, a situation of, I really dealt with a situation of unforgiveness. None of the minister really, really, really hurt us. I mean, he did serious damage to us. As a church, as, as an individual couple, 
I mean, people were meeting and calling this pastor, the pastor of Jeremiah, who had gathered under his wings all the flock that Pastor Ed Taylor had scattered around Greensboro. He was the pastor of Jeremiah. Yeah, and he was the pastor of Jeremiah, right? He was banging out one of the ladies from the church. Hello? Yes, sir, buddy. Meeting in the office at 2 o'clock in the morning, getting it on. I mean, had whoever that is. I don't know if it's, if it's Al Green or whoever it is. You know, let's get it on. Is that Al Green? Yeah, that's before he was the Reverend Al Green. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Now he's the Reverend Al Green. Let's get it on. <clears throat> yeah, he's saying let's get it on with the flock. He's the pastor of Jeremiah that gathered up. Marvin Gaye? Was it Marvin Gaye? Okay. So it's, it wasn't Reverend Al. It was Marvin. Love Marvin, but anyway. Yeah. Hallelujah. Not walking in love? Amen. And I had an issue. I really had an issue with that. I'm telling you, I had a real issue with that. And the Lord had to really deal with it. He dealt with me about it. And uh, I got the bruises on my ribs from my wife to prove it. Ah. Hallelujah. Because Brother Hagin was preaching on walking love, and she banged me every time. Wham, wham, wham. So get them pointy elbows out of my ribs. Good gracious. Woman. <laughs> she, she was getting me, but whack. What you going to do with what he's saying? <laughs> <laughs> How many have ever been where you didn't want to hear? Well, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Remember, some of, some of y'all probably either read the book or seen the movie, The Count of Monte Cristo. You know, and at the end where, she, where, where, where the girl comes to him and he says, don't rob me of my heat. It's all I have. His hate was what he used it to, 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 to survive with and whatever. And he wanted to get his vengeance. And she came to him with love. And he said, don't rob me of my hate. And there's a lot of Christians who get there. They don't want to be robbed of their anger or their hate. Mm. It will destroy you in the end if you don't. You'll be the one who gets destroyed. And anybody attached to you goes down with you. Mm. We have to learn the key of spiritual growth. One of the keys of spiritual growth lies in walking in love and forgiveness one towards another. Forgiving people who've done us wrong. Yeah, every, listen, everybody in this room has been done wrong by somebody. Some of you keep good records of it, too. You know when they did you wrong. You know how long ago it was. You know how many times that you've given them the opportunity to have asked you to forgive them for doing you wrong, and they hadn't yet, and so you ain't forgiven them. Just, I wasn't going to do it, but for, just for the sake of, of, of reiterating this point, making this point really well, Dad Hagen used to tell a story. He, they had taken a pastorate, a, a, you know, a church, and, and, and began pastoring. And, and they went in and preached on a Sunday morning and had to leave that, ne that next day on Monday to run to the, the, conference, uh, the conference rally, the district rally, whatever. You know, the back, you understand denominations, once a year they'll have conference rallies where all the ministers come in, they have services, but they also take care of business. You know, they'll take care of, you know, paying your ordination fees, getting your, your papers renewed, ordaining people, da 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 There's a lot of things, a lot of business takes place behind the scenes during this besides just the services of preaching. Now, a lot of the members of the stuff will come for the, for the big services, but the ministers are also behind the scenes taking care of a lot of business in between the services. That, that's, that's the way it's always been. And so they preached on Sunday, left Monday for the meeting, got back on the, the following Sunday and preached. And then that next Monday morning, so they've been, you know, been in town, you know, uh, preached on Sunday, gone, preached on a Sunday, so that Monday, Tuesday, whatever. So eight, nine days after they finally got to that church and got started. And one of the ladies for the church came walking up the door early in the morning, knocked on the door and said, and they went to the door and said, Brother Hayden, can I talk, can I talk to you? And came in, oh yeah, they got, they, they kind of exchanged niceties. And you can usually tell when people are beating around the bush. Yeah. Well, how you doing? How's the weather? You know, did y'all enjoy your trip? Da, da, da. And they're all waiting to kind of get to that point where they, they can dive into yeah. whatever it is they showed up for. Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, pastors do it too. How you doing? What's going on? You living in sin? All right, anyway. <laughs> we easy, you know what I'm talking about? We just don't go, you dog sinner, you? We just, we easy. Anyway. <laughs> Hallelujah. And the person, if they're living in sin, knows what's coming. They're trying to avoid it. Uh, they're trying to talk about everything in the world except that issue. They're trying to avoid anything near that if they can because they know what's coming. All right. So they're, they're, they're kind of unpacking this for them. So they say, well, come on in. She starts talking. And she says, well, Brother Hagan, I thought I'd come by and let you know what happened. He thought, oh, man, we just got here, been gone for a week, and got, just got back, and now we're unpacking, and here, something's already happened in the church. 
Now, I can, I can relate to this. We, when we came to, to take this church, we, we, uh, we were interim pastors for about four months, and then we, we took it full time. We, we came through on a Sunday, preached, left and went up to the mountains on vacation, came back and preached the next Sunday. And when I came back through on that second Sunday, some guy in the church had everybody on the platform, and he was chewing them all out. And I thought, my God, what has happened? I mean, you know, I mean, the pastor, the, the, the pastor that pastor church had died, you know, this guy thought he was Jesus walking on water and going to run the whole thing, you know, and, and uh, he had them all there chewing them out, and then I found that he left, <laughs> and we won't get into his story. Anyway, <laughs> that's a whole nother story, but I can understand, you, leave, you come through one Sunday, come back the following Sunday, and something's happened in between, and you, walk, you just walk right smack dab into a door. Everybody walked into a door before? Uh-huh. Um, just a little funny story. One time we were at our other home, and we had a Buick Regal two-door. So, I mean, the door was really long. And uh, Jessie was in the back seat in her, her car seat. And, and so I got out and shut my door, walked around to James. was going to open the door, let her out, and then get Jessie out of the back seat. Well, when I got to her door, I dropped the keys or something. And so I bent down, and Janie didn't see me. <laughs> so she opens the door and goes, wham! Right, I mean, right here. Oh. This is where the term knock the snot out of you came from. <laughs> all this liquid in my head splatters all over the driveway. And I'm sitting there going, man, you just knocked the snot out of me. <laughs> now I know what it means. I have experienced it. I mean, every, every bit of fluid in my head just went. <laughs> she cold cocked me, man. Moral of the story, <coughs> announce you're coming up to the door. I am coming to the door now. Anyway, <coughs> so how come I said all that? <laughs> yeah, walk into a door. Boy, when you walk into a door, it can, it can, it can ring your bell. And um, so, you know, Dad, he, he's sitting here, he's got, he's unpacking this woman. She says, well, I need to tell you what happened. And she starts, and she says, now, um, Sister so-and-so, you know, she did this, and she started in and all this stuff this woman had done to her. And after a few minutes, he said, whoa, 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 sister, whoa, 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 whoa. Now, when did this happen? She went, well, let's see, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. He's thinking, he's, and he's, hey, you know how fast your mind works. She got to seven. He's thinking, well, seven days ago, we were down, you know, we were down in, uh, at the conference. So it was last, it was like Tuesday morning of the following week. So it's like, you know, I mean, last Tuesday, something happened last Tuesday, right after we left town. She said, uh, seven, seven years ago, this coming Wednesday. Seven years ago. And he said she must have looked at him. He must have, his fl mouth must have just hit the floor. Because when she, she that, that, and he looked at him, he went, and she went, whoa, whoa, now, no, no, don't misunderstand me now. I've forgiven her all right, but I never will forget what that old devil did to me. <laughs> we need more people who got some boldness. And he looked at her and said, Sister, you're a bald-faced liar. Now, most people, oh, yeah, 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 run out of the church and go, and go split the church. The pastor called me a liar. He said, the Bible says you're to forgive. And the forgiveness of God, is, if God forgives, he casts our sins into the sea of forgetfulness. He removes them as far as the east is from the west. And our iniquities, he will remember, remember no more. You're saying you can remember. She remembered to the day. Seven years ago this coming Wednesday. My goodness. Boy, they had it down to the day. I have, I've forgiven her all right, but I never will forget what that old devil did to me. Oh, I'm walking in love and forgiveness. But I'll never sit down and eat with them again. Now, I'm going to say something. A few years ago, we had somebody leave our church. It hurt us. It hurt us. It hurt us. It hurt us bad. A couple of years ago, the Lord told me to call the husband and, and tell him and ask him to forgive me because I didn't deal with it right. I called him up and had him come down to my office. I said, look, I said, you guys left? Now, whether you were should have left or not left or how I feel about it or how you feel about it, it's totally irrelevant. The Lord told me and dealt with me and said, you didn't handle it right, so I'm asking you to forgive me because I didn't. My attitude and how I handled your leaving was not right. Forgive me for not handling that right. Yeah, but you, you, they left you, you didn't leave them. It doesn't matter. That's irrelevant. I have to walk in love and forgiveness with people. 
I, now, honestly, I don't believe it was ever malicious. You understand what I'm saying? I don't believe it was a malicious thing. I believe they just thought they were doing what they were supposed to do or whatever, or for whatever reason. People, people have reasons they do stuff. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're wrong, sometimes they're God, sometimes they're not. But you know what? We as, other, as mature Christians have to forgive people when they do the things that aren't right to give them an opportunity to get right. You're right. And get those things straightened out at some point in time between them and the Lord. It's not my responsibility to hold them in captivity and bondage. So anyway, uh, so we come up on a vacation Bible school this year, and, and the wife offers to help us. And we said yes. Now I know maybe somebody, maybe some of you had a hard time with that. But you know what? We love them. We're for them. We want their best. We got the best for them. We want their family to prosper. We want them to prosper. We want them to flourish. Yeah, but they need to come and ask you. You need to, if they walk in the doors of this church, find out and, and see if the Holy Ghost said you've, they repented or not. I, that's not my business. You're right. Go ahead. That's not my business. Are you here? Yeah. We love them. We're for them. Believe God's best for him. Were you hurt? Yeah. But you know what? That's why I had to forgive because we were hurt and, and you can get angry and bitter and resentful when somebody hurts you. You just have to walk in forgiveness and love towards people. Yeah. Amen. Listen, it broke up a ministry team mm -hmm. in the Bible. Do y'all remember Barnabas and, and, and uh, yeah. Paul? Mark went with them on a mission trip and left and went back before it was over. And the next time Martin was going to take him, Paul said no. And the Bible says the dissension between them was so great. Yeah. That Paul took Timothy and went one place, and Barnabas took Mark and went another. We never hear Barnabas again. Let me say something. I don't believe it was God's plan for Barnabas to be never be heard from again. Yeah, this is good preaching. Hello. Now here's the thing. I believe Paul got too angry. Because mm. later he writes and says, Bring Mark, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. Paul had to deal with some stuff. Now I'm sure Mark had to deal with some stuff. And somewhere in there, both of them got it right, and Paul says, Bring Mark. If we, if, what if Paul said, I don't care what Mark has done or what Mark has said. He, he, he left me and, and in, in a time of need, and I'm telling you, he'll never work with me in the ministry again. Yeah. Who are we to make that decision? What gives us the right to make that decision? Paul had to humble himself and say, you, you know, this is all in between the lines. You, gotta, you know this is yeah, going on. Yeah. Paul had to come to the place he said, Okay, I was mad. It cost us a ministry team. But Mark is useful for the kingdom of God. And it doesn't matter how I felt about what he did 15 years ago, whatever it is. He's profitable to the ministry. Bring him. Amen? So you have to walk in forgiveness to be able to do those things. Yeah. Right. And there are people, if you, keep, if you cut everybody out of your life through unforgiveness... You're going to lose people in your life who at some point in time are going to be an aid and a help to you. Now, when this person offered, we had a bunch of people who, who, who had said, who committed to helping us for vacation Bible school. And for some, some reason, no, at last minute, a lot of these people, things fell through, things happened, they couldn't be here for us. And it wasn't malicious, they just couldn't be here. Yeah. Now, here's somebody who comes and offers, and, 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 and Jane said, what do you think? I said, sure. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, but what if, what if somebody said, uh, it doesn't matter what people say. Yeah, we're going to walk in love. Listen, it's not always easy. And you know, we, 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 can, we can reason and go, well, I just don't think that's right. I think we shouldn't do things. Let's, let's just walk in love. Let's walk in forgiveness one to another. We're profitable to each other. I said, we're profitable to each other. I've got a minister a number of years ago did us kind of kind of uh, did us wrong, and now we reach out to them because they, 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 they've fallen by the wayside. They've lost their, their family, their church, and everything. We reach out to them and try to help them. Yet they did us wrong. You understand what I'm saying? Well, so what? They did us wrong. They, they made stupid, immature, arrogant mistakes. But that doesn't mean God's throwing them on the waste heap. And it's not my responsibility to make sure they stay there. It's my responsibility and your responsibility is to help recover people from those places. Because yeah. we love them. I said we love them. Y'all here, you go home. How many are still here? How many got up and left when I started preaching like this? <laughs> Some of you get up and leave in your hearts. No, it's not easy. Oh, my. <clears throat> 
People can be nasty and mean. You got to get some tough skin. Love them. Be there for them. Amen. Hello. I'm not talking, listen, I know there's times that we have church discipline, and, that, and that's, but do you know even discipline has to be done out of love? What did, what did the Bible say? God chasteneth those he loves. It's not because he's angry, it's because he loves them. He's trying to help recover them. <clears throat> the Word of God said, Paul even said in the book of 1 Corinthians, that he was going to turn such one over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. That his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Even that judgment on the man who was sleeping with his stepmama yeah. in the church was to recover him out of a snare. And when he writes in 2 Corinthians, which was really 4 Corinthians, if you go down to some history, 1 Corinthians is really second. There's really, they believe, four letters written to the church of Corinth, and the first and the third ones are missing. So 2 Corinthians and four, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians is really third and, or second and fourth. Now, are y'all confused? But in, in, in 1 Corinthians, what we have is called 1 Corinthians. Uh, and then in 2 Corinthians, Paul writes back and says, Receive such a one back into the fellowship. I'm paraphrasing a little bit. That he not be overwhelmed or overtaken in grief. The chastisement worked. It brought him into repentance. In that case, he, had, he was turned over Satan for the destruction of his flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. That was love. Well, let me tell you something, folks. It's a whole lot better to be chasing than to go to hell. Y'all here, you're going home. Hell's not a vacation. Are y'all here? I know that Led Zeppelin may be down there playing Stairway to Heaven, but there's not one. Hello? That group may be down there, oh, you know, there's a back, that, that back stairway up. Eagles had it right. The Hotel California, you can check in, but you can't ever check out. That was a song about hell. Well, how do you know that? Go get the old two-album jacket. Open it up. Yeah. And there's a dance floor, and there's a balcony. And up in the middle on the balcony is a, is a picture or a, a drawing of Alexander, I think Crowley is his name, the professed Satanist, and there's a 666 on his head. I've seen that. Now, you can't get album jackets, so you have to find some old one somewhere. Hotel, people run around singing Hotel California thing. It's a cool song. That's no, not a cool song. It's about going to hell and can't get out. But they really try to say hell was a party. Hell ain't a party. So, being chastened of the Lord, your, your spirit, uh, being t you be a turn of Satan for the destruction of your flesh, that your spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord, is a whole lot better ride than going to hell and staying there. That's love. Are you here? You're going home. Paul would rather him be, he would suffer destruction in the flesh than go to hell. Because hell's eternal. You might suffer a little bit of the flesh now. That, that's passing. I'll pass. Yeah. But hell is eternal. So even chastisement can be love. But you understand. Now, see, that's, that's church authority. That's church discipline. Let me say this. That ain't for you to do. You don't have the authority to do it. There's not a member in the body of Christ who has the authority to turn someone over to Satan for the destruction of flesh except ministers and under God-given instruction to do so. Read it. Paul said, when you're gathered together, I'll be there in the Spirit, and I've judged already. By apostolic authority, he did that. You didn't have Joe Blow, lead deacon, turning people over. <laughs> yeah, right. right. <laughs> that was an apostolic authority thing. You have to have the authority to do something like that, and you don't have it. Yeah. Uh -huh. Nobody in this room has it. The only person in this room that could do it would be me, and it would be under the direction of, the, of God and the Holy Ghost. Uh -huh. Or God the, God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. That's the, only pe that's the only way. You just don't do stuff. Yeah. You walk in love. And when that is necessary, it is out of love. But it's not, you say, don't, don't be, well, I've already turned them over to Satan for the destruction of your flesh. Boza, who do you think you are? You don't have that authority. So it doesn't, you don't qualify to do that. And some people, some people read scriptures, they think, hey, I'm, I'm something else. 
Let me tell you something, folks. A lot of people who think you're a man, man of faith and power are nothing but paste and powder. You don't have the authority to do some things you think you've got the right to do. You don't have the authority not to walk in love. I did not get finished today. So next Sunday, we're going to come back, and we're not going to talk about walking in love. Because you're going to think about this all week. And you're going to take account of who you haven't been walking in love with. Amen. Y'all hear you going home. And you're going to get in forgiveness. Let me say something. If you've been holding against somebody, you may have to just call them up and say, I need to talk to you. But they did be wrong. It don't matter. Let me ask you a question. I'll give you an example. Um, about 2,000 years ago, at the end of about 33 and a half years of ministry, a man named Jesus, there was no guile in his mouth, who didn't know wrong, didn't know sin, only loved people, raised the dead, healed the sick, cast out devils, minister life everywhere he went, a bunch of folks nailed him to a cross and hung him out to die. And while they spewed out profanities and mockings and railed against him, who when reviled against, reviled not, the Word of God says. I know some of you are going, oh, I know where he's going with this, doggone it. Said in the moment when they were being the most vicious and hate-filled and demonstrative and cursing and, de and mocking him, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Well, that was Jesus, and he's different than us. How many remember Stephen? Anybody remember Stephen? Over in Acts, around the fifth chapter or so? Yeah. And uh, they took him out in the field and started stoning them, him to death. And he looks up and says, I see the Son of God standing at the right hand of the Father. And boy, that got him mad, and they stoned him harder. And as he's about to take his last breath and die, he said, Father, lay not this sin to their charge. Did any of them ask for forgiveness? As a matter of fact, some guy named Saul was there holding the coats of all the men who were stoning them, and something got into him, the Bible says, and he was consenting unto his death. And next thing you know, Paul goes around, breathe, Saul goes out breathing out threatenings against the church, taking any in that way to be fed to the lions. But either in the case of Jesus or in the case of Stephen, one person standing there met the conditions that we could demand for them to ask for forgiveness to be forgiven. When Jesus said, lay not this, so Father, forgive them, they don't know what to do. And Stephen said, lay not this sin to the charge. No one in that crowd asked for forgiveness in either crowd. I said no one in either crowd asked for forgiveness. So when you come up with some Mickey Mouse goobity gawk that says, if they do such, 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 I'll forgive them. I ask you, what makes you better than Jesus? What makes you better than the first martyr of the church, Stephen? That you can set conditions on which people have to ask you to forgive them before you forgive them when our example, the Lord Jesus Christ and Stephen following that example, both forgave those who killed them without being asked to forgive. Now, I know some of you feel like there's an arrow through your head. Remember Steve Martin? <laughs> Man, I feel like I got an arrow through my head. Oh, I do. <laughs> Remember that? <laughs> oh, I feel like my head's in a vice. What? It is? <laughs> That's how Steve Martin got to start. Arrows through the head and vices on his head. Anyway. Think the only condition that can be set for forgiveness is you must forgive. That's the only parameter. And you do not have authority or right to set any more. Now, I expect you to say, Amen, O me. 
ouch or help me Jesus at this point. This deafening silence. The four Volkswagens just got pulled in off the intersect where people went, <gasps> sucked all the air out of the room. You don't have the authority. The authority you have is to forgive. Yeah. You're commanded to forgive. And the follow-up statement can never be, yeah, but what about me? Hmm. Forgive. Walk in love. Be a person, a creature of love. And forgiveness unconditionally. Did you, did you know God won't even accept? You may bring it, you may put it in the bucket, you may give it to a church, you may give it with your credit card, you may send it off to a minister, but God doesn't accept your gifts if you don't walk in forgiveness. He said, if you come to the altar and your brother's got all against you, you go and be reconciled to your brother and then come bring your gifts. You're confessing prosperity. You're confessing their tithers' rights. You're confessing givers' blessings and so forth. And you, you brought your gift, but God said, you better put it down and go get that straight. Because I'm not going to receive this if you don't get that. Because this don't mean anything to me if you're not doing this. This is my commandment, that you love one another. Amen? Mm -hmm. Remember that song we used to sing? This is my commandment. That you love one another. That your joy may be full. Oh, this is my commandment. That you love one another. That your joy may be full. That your joy may be full. Amen? By this, by this, shall all men know you are my disciples. I got Cadillac. I got prosperity. I got, a, I got my power tower on. I got my uh, Versace shoes on. I got my Bentleys. I got my helicopter. I got my jet. Nope. By this shall all men know you are my disciples, that ye love one another. He don't give a rip. People don't care if you got a Bentley. I'm a power Christian. Look at my car. They don't care. Do you love people? Jesus didn't say they'll know you by your. Of course, the hands that he was he would have said, you know, because you got a high end mule. Because that was that was a that was your prosperity sign back in those days. You had a mule, you were prosperous. You had a, you had a form of transportation other than walking. Because you got a mule, people know you're my disciples. He said, by this one thing, one thing, listen, not even faith. We're to live by faith. But faith was not a demonstration. You were his disciple. We love one another. Is the sign to the world that we are the disciples of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Because we love one another. That means your flesh is going to have to take the back seat. As a matter of fact, Paul said, Paul said this. He said, I buffet my body daily. Now, I know it's spelled the same way as buffet, but that does not buffet. It does not mean go and crowd your body every day. I buffet my body daily. Some folks buffet it. Back when Sonny's was around everywhere, they went to Sonny's breakfast bar, Golden Corral lunch bar, and somebody else, and, and I guess one of the other, the other all-you-can-eat things at night. They were buffeting all the time. No, you buffet. Paul said, I buffet, I keep it under. Yeah. Daily. Well, your flesh will rise up. All, it, it, some folks got to got buffet it 24-7. I mean, every hour on the hour. Yeah. Grab yourself and slap yourself a couple of times. <laughs> like that, I remember that old shaving lotion called uh, Skin Bracer. Yeah, yeah. Pow, pow. Thanks. I needed that. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, some folks need a little skin bracer attack on their flesh. Well, I don't want to go to church because there's people there I don't like. You can buffet your body. Hello? Well, I'm just going to change churches, go somewhere else, and be with some other people. It won't take long. 
eventually, no matter where you go, you won't like people. <laughs> you know why? Because you went there. The real problem is not the people, it's you because you don't walk in love. You're not dealing with your flesh. You're not keeping it under. You're not, you're not controlling your flesh and saying no to your flesh and demanding your flesh back off and let the real man, the spirit man, walk in love. Do you know why pride goes before instruction and the Holy Spirit before fall? Because pride is a thing that feeds into your feelings and your ego and all that mess where you've been hurt or injured or, or whatever and your, your reputation is at stake or how people think about you or what you think people think about you. That's, how it That's about 90% of it, what you think people think. I'll tell you what they'll think if you walk in love. They'll think you're most of the time a bigger man or a bigger woman than them because you're walking in the love of God. And they hadn't learned that. We need to learn to do that. Yeah. Everybody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Now, all those whose toes are, are broken or are sprained or uh, severely damaged from this message today where I stepped on them, please come up here and we'll pray for them. <laughs> Anybody need to be prayed for for your toes? Everybody's toes okay? Yeah, I know some of y'all did. You curled them up in your shoes and stuck them up under the seat so I couldn't step on them.